Welcome everyone to portfolio management during crisis number 10. We are the 2nd of July, I'm in London and you are everywhere in the world. So quickly, for those of you who don't know me, I've been trading since 2000. I started in Paris in 2000 as a cash equity trader, working for a small asset manager. Then in 2004, I worked for four years for a hedge fund called Griffin Capital Management, where we were managing on the Western uh, European team between 150 million euros and uh, almost 750 million euros at one stage. Um, and the overall team with Eastern European was managing 3 billion. Then in 2009, I moved to uh, for trading at Infinity Capital Management, which is uh, the UK branch of First New York Securities, which is a big prop trading firm in uh, New York, in the US, where I've been trading for 10 years with an absolute return mandate, no asset regions constraint, um, no time frame, I'm just about making money. From 2014 to 2017, I was a senior mentor at the ITPM that I left at the start of 2017 and I restarted in 2018 my own mentoring program. And in October of last year, I launched the 4x4 video series. Okay, so that was for the quick introduction. So what are we gonna be covering today? As always, I would love for uh, doing a bit of presentation, technical analysis, meaning price action, across asset classes, stocks, credit, commodities, and FX. Then we're gonna quickly be uh, looking at what happened in H1 uh, 2020 across asset classes again. And then we're gonna be discussing the PMI, which is, for those of you who don't know, is a leading indicator, but this is a leading indicator that has been struggling to say the least recently. And this is something that we discussed at least uh, the last two sessions, but we're gonna do it again. I would like to discuss um, something that um, where people are sometimes struggling, uh, which is using different time frames in your trading or your portfolio management. And I know that because through my career, I've been trading literally from one minute to two to five years. Uh, I've done the whole spectrum. I uh, had questions about the stay at home stocks. So uh, that's something that could be interesting to look at, uh, especially because before we will be looking at some breakout strategies. And then we're gonna be finishing with the earnings season uh, that is coming in a week time. So last week uh, was the end of the quarter and uh, there was some talks about, you know, end of the quarter rebalancing. Um, so the market uh, digested very easily this end of the quarter rebalancing for mutual funds. Um, now we are going into a, a long weekend in the US as the markets are close to more in the US with uh, the 4th of July. Um, today we had the, the NFP, the non-farm payrolls. Um, so there are always, uh, with many numbers, economic numbers that we have these days, there are two ways to look at it. Either you are thinking everything is fine and it's a V-shaped recovery, or you think actually, you know, the numbers are not, are not that great. So on the positive side, you know, we had 4.8 million jobs created, uh, but still under um, um, the unemployment rate is at, uh, I think it was 11.1%, uh, which is still very high. And again, the numbers, as we've seen last month, are extremely distorted by uh, the PUA, for instance, the pandemic and employment assistance and all the, uh, uh, the schemes that uh, we have in the US and across the world to help uh, people that uh, lost their jobs. Um, so let's start now with the price action and let's open, if I can, some, where is it? Let's open it if I can. Okay. So let's start with the price action. So for those of you who are new with technical analysis, um, this is a trading view, uh, which is everything is free. And literally I'm using the same as, uh, as you guys. Um, so let's start with, uh, here we have the um, S&P mini futures. 
uh, and I want uh, to try today to be looking at different um, um, time frame. Normally, we'll be looking at the daily, but as the market is um, is more volatile than usual, I think it makes sense as well for you uh, to look at what we have on 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 the um, on the shorter term time frame. So here we have uh, 15 minutes. So I picked the 15 minutes. We had the downtrend. Um, until the 29th of June, then we bounce and we have been trading in an up move. Um, what is interesting is the, the on the future, the 31.50, 31.45 uh, so far has been a strong resistance, um, which we can see on the S&P level. So on the S&P level, if we move on, if we move on the daily basis, um, something that we discussed there is still this island reversal. So island reversal meaning gap up, then gap down, uh, which has not been filled. And as you can see, many candles have been struggling. Um, uh, and, and, and those one, two, three candles are telling you that, you know, it, it, the market is fading uh, when it, it is going higher. So this is for the S&P. But um, as probably most of you know, uh, the, S uh, the, the NASDAQ composite and the NASDAQ 100 is giving you a completely different picture. Uh, so the NASDAQ has been outperforming the overall market um, massively, has been outperforming uh, the S&P. And if you look at the NASDAQ versus the S&P, we are back at levels that we had in 2000. Okay, so we have done the full circle now. Um, if we do the SPY versus the Russell 2000, uh, the Russell has been struggling uh, since the start of this year. Uh, and this is something that we're going to be looking when we look at the, uh, the H1 2020 performance. Um, but the small and mid caps have been really, really struggling. If we look at something that is interesting, again, which is the Russell uh, growth versus the Russell um, value, um, it is not making new high, but it is cl close to, to, to the new highs. On the XLK, which is really the sector that has been trending and trending and trending, it is making new highs after new highs. So the, the price action of the NASDAQ is extremely bullish so far. Uh, if we look then, you know, at the uh, VIX, it is not making a recent new lows, but um, at least, you know, it is, uh, it is now at 28% uh, roughly. Uh, so if we think about the long-term chart, which I really like about the VIX, is to put everything into perspective we need to think that the average implied volatility since its creation in 1991 is around 19%. Okay, so we are way above. Um, despite the market, which doesn't feel like uh, um, having such a high implied volatility. Um, on the 10 versus the two, the 10 years, so for those of you who don't know, this is the, now we are moving into credit. Um, I always like to be looking at the 10 years, US 10 years versus the US two years. This is the yield curve. The yield curve is still at 50 dips. So there is a bit of steepening, uh, not that much. US 10 years overall is, is trading between 60 and 70 dips. Um, there, is, there, there was a bit of, of tension this week, but if we look at uh, the other um, ETF, ETF are trending okay, uh, except uh, high yield. So high yield, uh, for those of you, of you who are following, high yield are, have been struggling even uh, after the Fed said that they will be intervening big time. And what was interesting is um, it was on Monday, the, on Monday the volume both on the HYG and the JNK was extremely strong. So there were some talks that, you know, it was um, end of the quarter some rebalancing uh, so there was a big volume moving into uh, from credit credit i've discussed many many times i think you should be looking at the euro dollar you should spend a lot of time as well on the credit because this is clearly where is the risk for the market uh, this is the fed has been uh, uh, so there was the release of the fed yesterday um, and so there is talk of controlling the yield curve uh, this is the big talk, what is going to happen in the next two to three years, what the Fed is going to be doing. Clearly, the Fed is following what Japan has been doing, which is controlling everything uh, uh, on the credit market. Um, if we look at 
um, commodities. Again, I'm, I'm using the, the futures for, for oil. Uh, why? Because CL1 uh, was trading negative a couple of months ago. We are struggling around the 40 levels to move higher. Um, it's still the same, the same issue, which is the demand is at uh, 90 million, uh, whereas normally it should be at 100 million. So you have a mechanical basis of 10% uh, year to then uh, uh, down, um, and, and still you get um, uh, a lot of uh, possible supply coming through, um, through stocks. Gold, again, we discussed, I mean, it, it, last week I've been tweeting, normally I'm not like a, a big, big fan of, 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 um, of gold, but we can all see that the 1780, 1800 is at play now. Um, and if it goes, we can, we can really say that, you know, that we're going to have a, a big move. So if we look at the weekly chart, this is, you know, for those of you, Cup and Andrew, you go consolidation and then if it goes it's going to go ballistic um something that is interesting which is copper uh, copper has been rec recovering pretty well um we are uh, from the lows that means china is doing a bit better than uh, than before um if we look at other uh, commodities like palladium it's not really recovering yet uh, let's go back into a daily chart uh, finally uh, quickly on the currencies, uh, so currencies are not that much moving. I mean, again, uh, if for those of you who are joining, because today there are decent people, is um, number of people is if you're trading FX, um, there is much more opportunities in the, in the stock market than there are in FX. Uh, if you look at the, the, the last uh, six months, I mean, this is a no-brainer. Um, they, they are always trying to do, but, you know, I think um, uh, get educated into stocks. Uh, there is uh, many opportunities. I want to be looking as well on, on, at single names quickly. So HSBC that I've been mentioning over and over, uh, big um, UK Asian bank, which is struggling close to the, to the all time low. Um, JP Morgan as well, um, despite the price action of the overall market this week and um, the, um, the Nasdaq. So last week we discussed uh, about the, uh, the bank stress test done, done by the Fed. As you can see, um, it is making new lows. I mean, I'm talking on 20 sessions uh, uh, basis. Uh, price action is not great. And versus that, you have Amazon of those of this world, the Netflix that break all of them break uh, uh, broke out yesterday. So yesterday was a very strong price action across those names. Uh, we had moved between five and fifteen percent. Tesla was another name. Uh, really, the whole space is moving like there is uh, no two more uh, to name some of the names. Square, Amgen was really really strong. So today we're going to try to discuss quickly about, you know, breakout and how to identify breakout and how to play them because you know, this is a strategy that uh, over the last couple of months has been working pretty well. So let's try, if I manage to do it, yes, um, to go now into H2 performance um, across asset classes. So my philosophy has been, I started really um, when I was trading, mainly to looking at price action, I had no idea about fundamental, I had no idea about nothing, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and I slowly but surely educated myself. But price action is can be considered like really like a, like a, being a trader and doing more fundamental, you know, people will say you're more a portfolio manager. I really don't care about how you put yourself and how you name yourself. But what is interesting is to put the two together. And what is important as well is to understand what has been happening before, um, as well as, you know, if you are forecasting something, you need to make sure to understand what happened before. And that can be both in terms of fundamental analysis and in terms of price action, technical analysis. So to make it a bit shorter, um, this is H1 for the uh, indexes. And here, when I say indexes, this is the ETF uh, of, those, uh, of, of the different countries. So as you can see, Again, the Nasdaq is top of the leaderboard, uh, extremely strong. And then we have Brazil, Colombia, 
uh, which is which can be understood in Mexico as well um, uh, by the currencies that have been very very weak. Uh, Greece as well has been weak. Um, and again, what I strongly advise you to be doing is to be doing those spreadsheets, those screening on a different time frame. So you're going to have a very short term time frame, five days. You're going to have a bit longer, one month, three months, five years. And that gives you the, the overall picture. And to me, this is something that is extremely helpful. You don't need to be checking every single day, but starting with the index, that gives you the overall picture. Then, are you long Denmark? No, I wish. Um, <laughs> I wish I was long Denmark. Uh, so yes, this is a good point, uh, Alex. This is um, clearly the um, uh, overperformer uh, in Europe uh, that's been doing pretty well. I've been looking this week as um, at, um, because I'm French, obviously, and I look at uh, Germ the DAX versus um, Fran the, the, the French CAC 40. And it's incredible. Do the DAX versus the CAC, it has been uh, trending always for the last 15 years. No, no reversion to the mean. Um, on the asset classes, okay, so that's the same. Um, here, uh, I uh, just on the year to date, gold is top of the leaderboard, um, followed by uh, NASDAQ, uh, technology, NASDAQ biotech, bonds, tips. Uh, cash. So here you have a lot of, in reality, risk off, okay, risk off assets, and uh, something that can be um, seen obviously as very risk on, which is the Nasdaq. So you have at the top of uh, uh, of this H2 performance um, a lot of risk off and a strong risk on, which 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 has been a struggle for many market participants, me included. Okay. Um, at the bottom, we get oil. Uh, so here, this is the USO. Uh, again, if you look at probably uh, the, the webinar five or six, when we were discussing the contango and USO, uh, USO has been a really bad uh, proxy of, of, of WTI. Um, but uh, more or less, what is interesting is to know that oil and energy have been doing badly, commodities same. At the bottom, bottom three is financials. Um, my conviction is always the same: is it's it's really hard uh, to have, um, um, uh, let's say, um, a good market if financials are so weak. Okay, so across the world, financial banks have been really weak, which which makes sense because we're going to see uh, companies defaulting, the economies are struggling, but that means the the health of the overall market is not that great. Then we have again the small caps, the mid caps that are massively underperforming the big caps. And we have as well industrial, which means you know economic cycle is struggling. Uh, so that gives you the overall picture on an asset class uh, uh, um, level with financial, industrial, small and mid cap underperforming the overall market. No industries. Um, beauty of the US market, you can do the same with many um, ETF uh, gold miners. Okay, so that's the risk off. And here we have really the, the big names that have been uh, moving the market. So, it, so that's the that's social media, cloud computing, internet, um, really, really strong, uh, particularly since the bottom that we had uh, uh, on the 23rd of March those sectors have been on, on a complete fire. On the other hand, obviously we have, again, uh, the COVID affected sectors like airlines, energy, oil and services. But again, very interestingly, uh, the banks are, are close to the bottom. Uh, and to me, that is a great indication that something really, there's a really big struggle uh, for the economy and, and, and the overall picture of the market is, is, could be a bit misleading. Um, on the commodities, again, commodities, gold, silver, um, those are the only two ones that are positive for the year. Otherwise, all commodities are done on the year, all of them. 
Um, so by definition, you use commodities um, when there is economic activity. When there is less acti economic activity, that means the demand is going lower with still a decent supply. So there is an imbalance, and this is what we, why we see uh, commodities negative on the year. Finally, currencies. Uh, <laughs> so the currency is living in the UK. Um, you can see that uh, the sterling is uh, making, you know, the, is really the, the weak currency this year. Um, and obviously, it depends which way you look at it. Um, and that's the same with the Bra uh, Brazilian real, which is down 36%. Uh, the South African czar uh, and, and the Mexican peso. Um, so you have exposure to emerging market exposure uh, or, or, or dealing badly with uh, the COVID. And on the other hand, you get the sterling that was supposed to outperform the market after Brexit. And actually that has not been playing so far according to the plan. Okay, so that's for the currency. So let's look now into um, the ISM manufacturing. So yesterday, so the ISM manufacturing, for those of you who don't know, is um, normally a very good leading indicator. Okay, so that's a survey that is done with uh, 300 more um, uh, companies in the US. Uh, it has been around for years and years. And the idea is you're gonna have a survey from uh, one month to another. So the problem that we have is based on this month on month survey, which you are asking people, how do you feel? Do you feel better? You feel the same or do you feel worse? And normally, if we think about what happened as we had Armageddon in uh, up to end of April, beginning of May, we should have much higher numbers from the ISM, from the PMI, from everything. The reality is if you ask people now, um, because of the magnitude of the change of the downside, um, uh, ISM, PMI, all those surveys are not as, as effective as usual. What we can have from, from the ISM from, from yesterday is yes, we are going at 52.6. I mean, it's okay, but if we think again, this is a month on month, this is not great. The new orders are the positive one, which is 56, which is the leading indicator of the leading indicator, which is a good thing and it's bouncing massively from the 31.8%. Um, the prices as well are starting to be positive. The negative side, which is the 42.1% of employment, which is a confirmation that, uh, that we have as well on the NFP today, is the longer we stay into uh, this slowdown, the harder is going to be to recover those jobs. Okay, so that means, you know, if you have a V shape, clearly those jobs are going to be back on track. Uh, if not, um, that means uh, we can, uh, uh, Bouncing quickly from, let's say, 18% unemployment to 11% is kind of easy. Then it's going to be much harder to move onwards. Um, but again, as we discussed before, uh, the PMI, the ISM has been extremely distorted. So yesterday, oh, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, two days ago um, IHS market came with um, an explanation uh, trying to tell people, you know, what has been uh, going on. And what is going on is um, um, when we have a strong downside moves like we had recently over the last six months, the months on months picture again is not working so well. So for those of you who are only generating IDs through ISM, that means you probably have been struggling big time. And this is why in the four by four video series, I want you to be doing other um, um, ID generation. Uh, and again, because that should be normal to have a, a bounce after Armageddon. So um, I think there was a good article yesterday on FT Alphaville explaining this, saying that this is a month-on-month -month survey, but everything is distorted. If we look at the PMI on a, uh, globally, uh, so this is something that comes with the 4 by 4 video series with the Excel spreadsheet, is again, um, we all know that um, April and May were really the bad month. Okay, so everything is, is, is flashing red except China, but we know that China, you know, this one is a bit of a funky one. And since then we have been a bit of a bounce. But if you go, if you start at, 50, uh, let's say at 100, you go back to 17, 
and then you bounce by 60, you're still probably going to be at 80%. So that means now the question is what the damage has been. Uh, yes, the picture is better. You have some countries that are doing better than others. I think the US are, are giving us a better picture than, than a month ago. And obviously, if we think about after a recession, so we had the start of a recession in February, okay, so February. Uh, and now we are moving quarter on quarter. So that means moving forward as we had the low point in May, normally everything should look better. Okay, so that means some of the headlines numbers are going to be looking better. If we look at this overall picture, we can see as well that the trend has, was coming lower. And uh, that was not only uh, for the Eurozone, which, you know, the top was at the start of 2018, but really in the US, we picked around the same, uh, a bit, let's say, in fall 2019. But since then, the world was slowing. So we were coming anyhow into 2020 with a world that was expected to go around 2.5 to 3% GDP. So um, don't, don't be that surprised that anyhow, you know, we were uh, uh, getting closer to the end of this economic cycle. Um, so the picture here, if you look, if you love chart, uh, so this is uh, US, China, Eurozone and Japan. Again, that has been uh, bouncing nicely, except uh, Japan, which is struggling to be bouncing. So next one, um, this is something that um, I wanted to discuss. I'm, I'm not going to be uh, spending uh, 50 minutes on it. It's just that this is a strategy for those of you who are actively trading. Um, I've been probably experiencing over the last couple of months, which is the breakout. So many people come to me and ask me, look, Greg, can I do some short term trading? Do I need to do one to three months? Can I do five months? And I said to them, you know, I've, I've been doing all the time frames, and literally it's about your setup and as well the opportunities. So this market, if you have been actively trading, again, over the last couple of months, from the law of the market, there have been some move up that have been very, very strong, but you can identify a strategy which is called breakout. So this is a strategy that actually could be applied on any single day. Why? Because if you take your universe, your US universe of stocks, which is roughly 2000 stocks, every single day, normally you should have some one, two, three, five, ten 10 stocks, which will be moving higher okay so which will be breaking out so the best thing to do is to be identifying by doing the breakout you want to be able to identify the market leaders the sector leaders and the industry leaders which is exactly what we have done before so at any point in time the, as well the breakout will allow you to identify what is moving the market and the way to identify the strategy is in, in a sense, pretty simple. So what you need to be doing is you need to be comparing the last, and when I say the close or the last price versus the last, let's say 20 days, 50 days, you, de you decide on your time frame, and to know at, uh, um, um, by how much it is close or far from uh, uh, the highs. So what you can be doing is you take your universe let's say, of 100 stocks and you say which stocks have been uh, a closing today between 2%, minus 2% and plus 2% of the highs of the last 20 days. If you can identify those stocks, if you can identify this with a significant volume, and again, you can do that on different time frames. Here, the idea is it's, it's mostly to try to identify things that are going to be moving. Okay, so we need to be adjusting our time frame. What you want to be doing is setting up some alerts. So if you identify a stock and you say, if this stock goes above 98 in the next three days, I think this is a breakout setup. Then I want this information to come at me. So you can be using websites like investing.com, for instance, you, which have a great set of alerts. You can be using which, whatever website you're gonna be, uh, you like to be using. And you can set up this strategy on both your universe or on uh, or, or, or some um, 
strategies that are meeting your criteria. So by definition, this is a strategy that works well for companies uh, first on the, on the bull market, and secondly, for companies that are experiencing high sales growth and high EPS growth. So the first screening that you could be doing is you select your whole universe again of stocks and you say, what about what are the companies that in 2020, 2021, or 2022 are going to experience or the expectations are for 20% plus sales growth? We are talking bottom line and 20% plus bottom line, which is the EPS. Instead of having 2,000 stocks in the US, you're probably going to have 100, 250. So already they meet your criteria of very high growth stocks that can be delivered. And then you're going to be adding this uh, strategy of breakout. But make no mistake, this is, uh, uh, um, as always, it's easier <laughs> to explain harder to trade. Okay. So if we look, um, uh, so this is something that I've been looking and looking and trading and, and over the last couple of months. Um, so those were the setup that I've been identifying over the last three days. So here on, on the second, that was this morning. So all of these setups are before the open of the US close. Okay. So this is again, the screening that uh, I'm using um, when I'm not too lazy every morning before the opens just to try to identify which sector, which industry, which names could be moving higher. And again, uh, the concept of the leaders and, and the laggards in the market are extremely important. So you take the following criteria, you take plus minus 2% from the recent highs, and you try to find the setup. Um, so here you're gonna have, for instance, uh, GSX, something that I mentioned last week when we were discussing a, a, a short seller. This is not necessarily a name that I like, okay? So I'll be care careful. There have been some rumors that this is a kind of, of, of wire card. But the idea is here, it's mostly based on, on, on the price action. So to give you an example, and here this is nice because you know it's back trading, and with back trading, we always uh, we are always making a lot of money, which I really like. Uh, so this is Shopify. Okay, so Shopify. Um, again, you know, you see the um, 930, 930. And you need to uh, consider that the stock has been trading up and up and up. Okay, so this is in, a, in an uptrend. So you know that the odds are for the stocks to go higher. And then it broke uh, on the 30s. And what is important as well, you want this move to be happening in stronger volume. Okay, and since then it has been moving. I think today the close were around 1040, something like this. Okay, if we take another example, it's Tesla. Again, I'm not going to pretend that I've been pretend, uh, uh, trading Tesla. I look and I saw the alerts at 1020. I didn't have the guts to go. Um, uh, and then it broke. Literally, this is a screening. If we go back to the screening here, you can see the name Tesla, Shopify. Um, and those, I, I didn't add any, any tickers. That were the tickers that you're going to have. So literally, you're going to have, especially on the bull market, you know, between five to 10 setups possible um, on a chart. And what I'm using, we can see here, this is a 15 minutes. This is a shorter time frame uh, because I want to be more active. I want to be better at identifying the levels. Here, same 15 minutes. You can be using one minute. You can be using early. You can be using a uh, different uh, time frame. Um, are you advocating day trading, Greg? How can you trade names of stocks based on price action, but you don't know any fundamentals of the stock? So what I said before is um, this screening is based before on those names based on, on fundamentals. So if I look at my fundamentals, I mean, it's mainly quantitative first. I look at companies where the expectations are for 20 plus, sales in the next two years, top line and bottom line. So I know that they have good fundamentals. Then, you know, uh, uh, I have better experience with some names than some others. As I told you, you have some names that uh, you will have some red flags like GSX, some names that I'm not as familiar as some others. But the idea is try to combine the two with an active risk management. So if we look and carry on 
with uh, that strategy that is obviously something that has been working pretty well uh, recently with the stay at home stocks. Okay. Um, so the stay at home stocks, what I've done, uh, what I'm, I'm mentioning the stay at home uh, stocks today is because I had a question, uh, I think it was last weekend, uh, someone telling me, asking me, do you see a change in, in the, uh, in this index, in those, uh, uh, in this universe? So I've been working, uh, for this webinar a bit on those, uh, 25 plus names, which are seen uh, and considered as being uh, stay at home stocks okay so we have uh, those stocks have been extremely strong leaders since the since the bottom of this market um, and here we have 27 names where the market cap uh, the market market capitalization goes between 4 billion uh, which is i think it's uh, wing uh, between wing to uh, 1.5 trillion, uh, which are the two names like Microsoft here, and we're gonna have Amazon here. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty large in terms of, of market capitalization. As we can see, it's mainly two sectors. Uh, so I picked the sectors in the industry. On, in terms of sectors, we have mainly information technology and consumer uh, discretionary. But in terms of industry, we have very uh, different industry names. So coming back to your questions about fundamental, what are those stocks in reality? So there is a misconception of people saying, you know, this is just a bet. People, you know, are just betting. Yes, I mean, there is a big move which makes the game harder. But uh, I've been doing the average sales growth of those stocks, okay, those companies. In 2020, we are expecting the market is expecting plus 19% top line growth, which is huge. Okay, if you think about the overall market, um, the S&P 500, we're expecting sales to come down in the year. Plus 18% for next year. In terms of EPS, plus 29%, plus 33%. For the S&P, for this year, we're expecting the market to be down by 30% for the EPS. But I think what was interesting as well for me is, and this is something that I'm trying to do these days when I do the mentoring, is I asked my mentee, can you tell me if the story is a V-shaped recovery? If that's a V-shaped recovery, that means the numbers uh, uh, um, uh, should be, um, first should be, should be recovering in 2021, but the revisions, how have been the revision of those business models? Out of this 27 stocks universe, the 2020 uh, expectant, uh, expected sales from a year ago. So if I take the 2020 sales expectation for this year versus what we had last year, for all of these 27 stocks, they have been revised up 5% and 4%. And out of these 27 uh, stocks, just to make everything uh, for the full disclosure, I'm not putting the number of Zoom, which is distorting any numbers because they have massive growth. But still, that means versus a year ago, this universe is expected to have higher growth, higher top line growth than a year ago. So that translates into what? If we look at the last month's move, this is the move of those 25, uh, 27 names. Here, again, this is the benchmark. I mean, this is a ben This is not a good benchmark because here you should be using the Nasdaq or you should be using uh, the software or those you know high movers. But overall, versus uh, against the market, as you can see, the big chunk of those names have been ex outperforming the market, which is uh, up 1.5 percent and has been trading sideways for months. And if we look over the last three months, again, if you look at the S&P. It's at the bottom where most of those stocks have been moving. So now let's look at the overall picture because I know there is a lot of, of noise. So in the blue, you get the SPY, okay, which is the S&P, and in orange, you get the stay at home index. So I think this move, that was the move that we had a couple of days ago. But at least what you can say is the trend is still your friend. So what you have is as always, you try to identify in the market 
what is making the uh, 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 what is making you eyes what is pushing the market higher and what is struggling in the market so here we have 27 names we have some other names um, some software but again as long as we see this strong price action there is no reason for the stay high from index uh, to turn around okay I'm, I, here i'm not calling that it's going to move another 15 percent higher and to be perfectly honest i'm not into it i'm not invested in that okay so i've missed everything and i'm not going to pretend that you know i'm not 50 percent on the year on those ones. it's just it's just not true but i think it's important for us to say okay what is making moving the market what is working these days in terms of strategy so as you can see as well here and the price action is important because it bottom here so the bottom here was three to five sessions before the overall market so as a leading indicator that was a good tell that it, it turned before the overall market and maybe it's going to be turning on the other uh, on the downside and it's going to be a good uh, um, leading indicator for the overall market for those of you who were trading in 2018 when we had the sell-off uh, at the end of 2018 what was interesting and you should be looking at your charts uh, at the end of september 2018 most semiconductors which before were leading the market like intel nvidia the sox index three to five days or a week before the overall s p started to tank at the start of october the uh, uh the semiconductors really struggled and there were the leaders okay so when you have the leaders that are turning sometimes and not sometimes most of the time that tells you that the market could be turning so at the moment you know overall those names are doing fine again you have if we come back here we have many many names and those names across a different industry inside two sectors but based on good fundamentals okay top line growth 19 percent 18 percent so yes we can all be or some of us can be struggling with the valuation because you know we are paying high multiples but still in a world where everyone is struggling to find goals by definition you're going to be buying you're going to be paying a premium for uh, companies that have higher goals than uh, the average market so now i want to be finishing with uh, the earning season uh, that is coming um, next that is starting next week so from from monday tuesday in a week time the earning season is starting uh, here i've been using numbers from uh, fact set uh, if you have if you're not into their uh, mailing list uh, just put your name it's, it's always helpful um, so this is really a copy and paste from fact set here which is the earnings growth for q2 2020 where uh, the estimate earnings decline for the S&P 500 is at minus 43%. Uh, so minus 43%, that tells you about uh, the size of uh, what we expect in Q2. And those numbers have been uh, coming down since uh, the last quarter. So literally analysts have been putting their numbers massively down. Uh, there is always the earnings guidance. Uh, in terms of earnings guidance and overall guidance, as you know, as we have seen for the ISM uh, with the companies that are struggling to tell us, you know, if it's going to be better, that's the same. Less and less companies are uh, okay or happy to give guidance about the business uh, in, in the next quarters. In terms of valuation, again, when you have valuation coming uh, or, or the earnings expectation coming uh, solo, that means. Uh, the P uh, mechanically is, is higher and it's much higher than the five year uh, average, which is at 16.9, and the 10 year average, which is at 15.2. So here you have a P that, that looks uh, pretty high. The question as well that uh, I didn't put, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, a tab here, which is uh, we have the elections coming. So in terms of building a portfolio, and trading so here we have the catalyst of the earning season the market has been trading um, so the s p have been trading sideways the nasdaq has been has been on the tier uh, and the next catalyst is the earning season in the next six to eight weeks okay so 
for the S&P, probably it's going to uh, uh, give some, some volatility and maybe uh, give some direction uh, uh, between this uh, 30, the 3000 and 3200 that we have on the S&P. Uh, then in terms of other catalysts, we have the elections coming. Okay? In terms of elections, Democrats versus Republicans, there is sometimes, you know, talks that, you know, because Biden uh, could be winning, that it could be bad for uh, uh, the overall market because suddenly the tax cut that Trump did, uh, the 20% is going to go back to the 28%. So if you look at the earnings growth of the market or the earnings in 2018, 2019, or at more 2017 and 2018, most of the earnings growth was coming from this tax, okay? Uh, it was not necessarily because the economies were, the US economy was on fire, despite uh, 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 what the government had been saying, it's mainly because of tax cuts. So if, if the tax cut is uh, reversed, suddenly the 160 here, so that's the earnings, the $160 operating earnings that you have, or 157 that you had in 2019, you could go back into the 130, 120, okay, for the earnings. So if you think about the move that we have here, so here we have the S&P, sorry, 500 operating earnings, okay, so that's the move since 1988. And those two years, two to three years, are not because the US economy was on fire. Uh, the US economy has, was like uh, any other time trending around two to 3% GDP growth, but again, because of tax cuts. If those tax cuts at reverse are reversed, the 160 goes back to the 120, okay? 120, if you do 120, Sorry for my uh, writing, times, let's say 20, which is the P, you end up with the S&P at 2400, okay? So that's to give you a picture. I'm not, go I I'm not gonna go into the camp of, you know, uh, if Biden is elected, it's gonna be bad for the market. Is that that's something that we need to, to keep in mind. More importantly, if you look at the US, what the market really liked over the last 10 years is uh, uh, um, there was never a huge majority, either Democrat or Republican. Okay, so the two chambers were always divided, which was a good thing for the market because either the Republicans or the Democrats were not in a position to go all in in their policies. So maybe one of the risks is actually if they go all in for, for the Democrats. That can be seen as, 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 as a risk for the overall market. But what you have here is um, just based on the earnings, now the expectations coming into the earnings season, we are at 110 for the year. Uh, 110, which is pretty low, coming from 157. So that gives you a 50 uh, down, which is 30% uh, roughly down on the year. Um, and if you look at uh, the last five years, so this is the S&P 500 operating earnings, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. So if you look at Q1, uh, this one is done, is over. Q2 are still, you know, at a very low level. Uh, so the expectations are pretty, uh, pretty big. Same for Q3, Q3 the expectations are low, and Q4 are kind of okay. Um, so we're gonna see how the companies are gonna be doing versus history. We need to keep in mind that historically, um, on average, companies are beating expectations 70% of the time, okay? Um, I read that in Q1 2020, out of the 500 uh, companies in the S&P, only 66% uh, beat, 30% missed, and 4% were in line. So, now we are coming into this earnings season, which is again next next uh, uh, next week, or let's say the, the week after this one. Um, so here do you have the expectations for the Q2 earnings. You have the quarter on quarter, which looks a bit better, and the year on year. Uh, so here the S&P and the 11 sectors of the S&P. So you can see the industrial, which is by definition extremely cyclical are going to be, uh, the expectations are very low and the numbers should be extremely low. 
Um, if we look at the utilities, which are defensive, it's zero and zero. Real estate is as well completely hammered. Um, and the financials here, because it was negative, we can't have, we can't have the numbers, but financials are gonna be suffering. For energy, we don't have the numbers because everything, or we don't have the, the change quarter on quarter on year on year because everything is negative. And um, uh, XLK is, is kind of, of flat. -ish. So expectations seem to be pretty low. Um, a good example was FedEx, which came with the earnings um, of the sales a couple of days ago, where they beat the most recent expectations. But actually, if you look at the same expectation from a month ago, it was lowered massively by the consensus. So what uh, we have here is coming into the earnings season where expectations uh, of the numbers are 30 to 40 percent down. Um, as always, when we looked last quarter, what you want to be doing is looking at the earnings season calendar and when are the companies that you're interested that are on your watch list or you're invested are coming with the numbers. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's going to be kicking from Tuesday, the July uh, the 14th, with, uh, always, with it's always JP Morgan, which is giving the, uh, the real kick of the earnings season. JP Morgan, Citigroup, Wells Fargo. So that's really for, for Tuesday the 14th. Then the day after, as always, you're going to have Goldman Sachs. I think in that way, Bank of America. Bank of America should be uh, here or the, or the day after. Um, and we have as well uh, the semiconductors. But overall, this is the kick of, of the earnings season. So this is in terms of catalyst. Why is the market trading sideways for the S&P, not the Nasdaq? If we think about the technology index, SM, uh, uh, NASDAQ, uh, NASDAQ composite, the expectations now are pretty, pretty strong. Okay, uh, pretty strong. Uh, that means that my view is there is not much room for this sector or for those stocks uh, to come with um, um, or to miss the numbers. Um, quickly, um, something that what I can offer you um, and where hopefully I can help you is um, I offer both a, a four by four video series, which is a very comprehensive video series and the mentoring program. So for those of you who are interested for doing both, um, I have more and more people who want to be doing both because they have been struggling to be making money. They have been struggling with different processes um, and they want when uh, and if you uh, decide to subscribe to the two, there is a discount, so contact me. I'm happy to answer your question. Again, four by four video series plus the mentoring works really well. Overall, the idea is me helping you building your infrastructure and making sure that with different uh, strategies, you're going to be able to uh, generate ideas every single week. Um, and that can be done as I try to do today across asset classes and across different time frames, okay, from portfolio management, which is, you know, one, three months or more, and active trading. Again, when you have a market that is moving that much, you need to be more active uh, in, in, in managing your portfolio. And really what I try to do as much as possible uh, is to be gener constantly uh, generating ideas, uh, a flow of ideas. Um, so for more information, you can go on the website, uh, if you want to re-watch this video or another one, uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube video. Uh, if you have any questions, um, so today I'm not going to do a Q&A session uh, because sometimes it's too long. And what I would love to do is if you have questions, please send me your questions to contact at GregoireDupont.com here. I'll be happy to answer. I'm even happy, you know, sometimes if you want to, to do a quick Skype session, to see if there is a match between what I can offer and what you'll be looking at. Um, and literally explaining and helping you uh, through uh, an email is sometimes much helpful than having to go through these uh, 25 questions. So I hope you enjoy the session today. I wanted to make it a bit shorter uh, as well because this is a long weekend in the US. So some of you probably are gonna be traveling uh, happy 4th of July for people in the US and um, 
see you soon uh, for another webinar. Thank you very much. Good night.